Welcome to our annual Fall Implementation Science Seminar Series. My name is Dr. Alethea DeRosiers, and I'll be hosting the Fall Seminar Series. I am an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at Brown University and a core faculty member of our Brown Research on Implementation and Dissemination to Guide Evidence Use, or BRIDGE program. This is now the seventh year of our Implementation Science programming, and we are thrilled to be able to bring these seminars to our Providence and Rhode Island community of implementation scientists, as well as to those of you who are joining us from other regions. We are grateful for the partnership of the Advanced Rhode Island Clinical and Translational Research, or Advanced CTR, for supporting the technology, logistics, and marketing of these seminars. We also recognize our partnership with the Brown Alcohol Research Center on HIV for their support. Now, without uh, further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Rosemary Meza is a collaborative scientist and clinical psychologist at Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute. Her work focuses on improving pragmatic models of mental health care delivery, designing interventions to leverage leaders and supervisors in improving evidence-based practice implementation, and advancing methods to improve the rigor of implementation science. The title of her present today, presentation today is Causal Pathway Diagrams, Understanding How and Under What Circumstances Strategies Work. Um, although I think we have a bit of an updated title here. Uh, I might've had, had an older one. Um, the presentation introduces causal pathway diagrams, a method for articulating the causal process through which implementation, implementation strategies work. Um, as a reminder, you can put your questions in the chat function throughout the seminar, and we should have some time for Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Meza, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, and uh, rest assured the content is still the same. Uh, titles change all the time for these talks that I tend to give, but um, really excited to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to some um, inter interesting discussion with you all today. So uh, the work I'm going to be presenting on uh, is a collaboration of thinking with some of our partners at Kaiser Permanente, Washington University, um, University of Washington, and um, University of Michigan as well. And so I'm going to be talking with you all about um, exploring causal processes and implementation science, really focusing on causal processes through which implementation strategies work. So I wanted to get us started with an example. <clears throat> so we know that regular depression screening in primary care um, is can lead to earlier detection of depression. And this works by increasing higher rates of referrals to care when it's needed. And it can have downstream improvements on um, mental improvements in mental health outcomes as well. And we also know that getting uh, clinicians to administer depression screenings regularly is challenging. So the question is, what can we do to address this problem? We have several reasonable options from the long list of implementation strategies that many of us leverage. And so um, lots of these are very reasonable. We can think about using something like task shifting, where we might take that depression screening and rather than asking a physician to administer it, we might ask a medical assistant to administer that instead. We might provide some sort of clinical incentives. So when a provider um, does a screening, we might incentivize their use of that screening. We might use something like audit and feedback where we give people feedback on their performance um, when they do screenings. We can consider doing something like clinical reminders where we remind people to do these screenings or distribute educational materials. Now the question becomes, which of these strategies should we choose? We have lots of options and it's hard to know what's the right choice in a particular setting. And the problem that we run into is our strategies are often misaligned with the barriers that we're trying to target. So let's take these for example. We might see that one of the some of the barriers to regularly administering these screenings is uh, divided attention. So we know that our clinicians have lots of stuff to do in a primary care visit, and so their attention is divided across many different tasks they're trying to get done. We might also see that 
<clears throat> there's a low perceived value for these depression screeners. So maybe this isn't at the top of their list of um, thing of uh, interventions that primary care physicians see value in, or maybe there's just a lack of time. Now, not each of these strategies is well aligned to address each of these barriers. So it matters why we're seeing um, low rates of depression screening. So for example, um, while some of these some of these strategies might be well suited to address something like divided attention, providing incentives and distributing educational materials probably aren't going to do anything to really center clinicians' attention on the need to provide these screenings. Similarly, while providing incentives and distributing educational materials might change a clinician's value of doing a depression screening, either by providing them some sort of financial incentive, incentive, which makes that seem more valuable, or educating them on the value of this screening. Things like task shifting, audit and feedback, and clinical reminders are going to do little to actually change perceived value. And similarly, with lack of time, the only strategy that's likely going to address lack of time is really being able to take this task off of that clinician and move it on to another person who hopefully has more time to do that. So the point here is that not all strategies <clears throat> are aligned to address the barriers and understanding those barriers is critical in helping us to select the right strategy. Now, even when our strategies are aligned with the barriers that we are trying to address, they often don't work as well as we hope. So um, we might see that uh, our strategies have a weaker impact than we would hope for. Um, maybe there's some impact, but we really don't see um, strong effect sizes. And oftentimes we see that this is due to things like characteristics of the context, um, that impact when and how well our implementation strategies work. So I'm going to be chatting with you all today about a tool called causal pathway diagrams. And causal pathway diagrams are essentially just a thinking tool. Um, it's a tool for helping us to articulate how our implementation strategies work and under what circumstances our implementation strategies work. And what they're really trying to do is slow down the process of thinking through each step um, through which implementation strategies work and try to anticipate potential threats to implementation strategies so that we can design better strategies, select better strategies, and plan in advance for some of the contextual factors that are likely to impact how well our strategies work. So backing up for a second, um, some of the asks, some of the components that you'll see or elements you'll see in these causal pathway diagrams are familiar elements that our field has been addressing for quite some time. So early on in implementation science, we were focused on our implementation outcomes, trying to understand when we're trying to implement uh, a new intervention, how do we know whether or not that implementation approach um, or that implementation initiative is successful? So focusing on really articulating what are those outcomes that we're trying to address? Things like, was it adopted when it, if it was adopted, Adopted? Was it done with fidelity? Was it sustained? Then we spent some time focusing on, okay, we understand, we're starting to get a better sense of what it means to, to, for something to be um, successfully implemented. And we spent quite a bit of time focusing on those barriers and facilitators or those determinants that impact um, that research to practice gap. And in the last couple of decades, we've accumulated a huge amount of literature um, organizing, describing the barriers and facilitators that get in the way. And then we've spent some time trying to uh, compile and articulate and design the strategies that are equipped to address those determinants um, and hopefully be able to lead to improved implementation outcomes. So as you can see, some of the, the stem of the causal pathway diagram is what we've been doing for the last couple of decades in our field.
Now, what we found from doing this work is um, there was a, a review that was recently done, a review of systematic reviews, trying to characterize what we know about um, the effectiveness of our strategies. And what they conclude is <clears throat> that the majority of reviews report strategies achieving small impacts, um, and these impacts were normally on processes of care. There's much less evidence that these strategies have shifted any patient outcomes. And so far, 86 systematic reviews of strategies to increase the implementation of research into clinical practice have been conducted. And as a whole, this substantial body of knowledge struggles to tell us more about the use of individual and multifaceted implementation strategies than it depends. So this is kind of discouraging that our conclusion right now is, do our strategies work? Well, it depends. And I think that it depends um, uh, question or conclusion is what we don't know a ton about is when do our strategies work and under what circumstances do they work? Um, taking this a step further, another recent systematic review by Ashcroft and colleagues um, reviewed, uh, did a systematic review of empirical studies of implementation strategies um, on re-aim outcomes. And here in the light blue, I don't expect you to be able to read all of this, but I want you to see that in the light blue, these are studies that had no significant effect. And the dark blue are studies that showed some significant effect on a re-aim outcome. So this was whether or not these implementation strategies had any effect. And this is regardless of the magnitude of that effect. And what I conclude from this is that we see a lot of variability in whether our implementation strategies have any effect. So yes, there are absolutely these examples where we do see improvements in outcomes. And there are many, many examples where we don't see any, any impact at all. So part of what we're trying to do with causal pathway diagrams is to improve the effectiveness of our implementation strategies and improve the consistency with which our implementation strategies are effective by understanding how our implementation strategies work. So focusing in on the mechanisms through which implementation strategies work, or this question, how do implementation strategies work to improve outcomes? And the second aspect that we have been focusing on is this question of under what conditions do implementation strategies work to improve implementation outcomes, to really answer that question of, um, to, to kind of clarify that it depends, well, what does it depend on? So I want to step back for a second and talk a little bit about why mechanisms matter in implementation science. So First of all, mechanisms matter because they help with the selection of implementation strategies. So like we were talking about earlier, um, when we when we take a, the, the time to really articulate, how is this strategy going to affect this determinant? It gives us uh, more clarity as to whether or not that implementation strategy is well aligned with the determinants that we're trying to address. The second thing it does is mechanisms broaden the options of strategies that could work. When we understand the process through which strategies can address a particular determinant, well, then that gives us options to consider what, what, um, what is our menu of strategies that could possibly activate this mechanism? So for instance, if strategy A isn't a good option at this clinic because maybe it has some resource uh, requirements that we can't meet, maybe strategy B could be selected instead. And lastly, mechanisms inform the operationalization of our implementation strategies. So for, as, as folks are probably familiar with, you know, one implementation strategy can be operationalized so many different ways. Let's take training, for example. Um, not all training is equal. And when we understand the way in which um, training is working to address a particular determinant, whether that training is just trying to improve a knowledge gap 
Or maybe that training also includes aspects of persuasion to try to change somebody's values about using a particular intervention. When we understand how, what mechanism we're trying to activate in that process of change that we're trying to activate, it allows us to think through how we might operationalize that training approach to activate that, whether that might be using didactic elements and modeling elements to get at um, more knowledge and competence, or maybe it's also using testimonials do, during that um, training to try to tap into people's values. So the next element that I, I um, alluded to earlier was this idea of effect modifiers. And in the, in the past few years, we've seen a growing focus on mechanisms. We've seen um, many more studies coming out about mechanisms, lots of writing about the importance of mechanisms. I think that effect modifiers are just, and maybe even more important than um, mechanisms, because it's really answering this question of under what circumstances do our strategies work? So when we're talking about mechanisms, or excuse me, when we're talking about effect modifiers, we're really trying to understand things that um, make something work better or worse. And in causal pathway diagrams, we break that down into two different types of effect modifiers. Um, as I was just mentioning here, these are factors that influence whether or the extent to which uh, a cause brings about an effect. So the first type of effect modifier we focus on is a precondition. And so you can think about, uh, I'll talk about preconditions and I'll talk about moderators. And if you, I think about preconditions like um, a light switch. So, you know, some of us have these fancy light switches, which maybe we have the switch on it and we have that like dimmer, that little knob that allows us to turn thing, turn the light up and turn the light down. Um, well, we can think about preconditions like that switch. Uh, these are factors that are necessary for an implementation strategy to exert its influence on an outcome. They need to be there, and if they are there, they make it possible that an implementation strategy can exert its influence. If it's not there, it's not going to be possible for that implementation strategy to exert its influence. Um, so it's kind of this all or nothing effect. The light switch is on, the light comes on. Uh, the light switch is off, the light is, has no chance of turning on. So um, if we let's let's take um, the example of task shifting. A precondition might be something like, can this person who we are shifting this task to, can they legally carry out this action? If it's not legal in this state for this person to deliver this intervention, there's no chance of task shifting working. If we think about the example of distributing educational materials, um, those materials need to be noticeable or catchy enough to grab somebody's attention. So if you have some educational materials put up in um, the in the break room for physicians and hoping that they're going to see these educational materials. If there's a bunch of other educational materials on the wall and this is just blending in, that that uh, material, that education is going to have no effect on that physician's practice. The other kind of effect modifier are these moderators. So rather than being that switch on or off, this is really that, um, that dimmer, that knob. So this is a factor that can strengthen or weaken the effect of an implementation strategy. So let's take um, task shifting again. An example of, an, of a, a moderator would be um, task complexity. The more complex the task is that we are shifting over to somebody who likely has less training and less expertise, it's probably going to be um, probably going to see less improvements in those um, implementation outcomes. Whereas with the simpler task, it's probably much more likely that we're able to see that person do this with fidelity. So you can see the more complex it is, the lower our outcomes might be. The less complex it is, the, the higher our outcomes might be. Or distributing educational materials, um, the extent to which somebody trusts the source of those materials might make the impact of those educational materials stronger or weaker. So why do effect modifiers matter? As we've been talking about with some of these examples, 
Um, we see that there's consistent unexplained variation in implementation strategy effectiveness, which is likely due to context. And I love this quote um, because it called out that many intervention and evaluation designs seek to eliminate these contextual confounders when these represent the normal conditions under which interventions must be integrated if they are to be workable in practice. So we can't eliminate these confounders in practice, so we shouldn't be trying to eliminate them in our study designs. We should be trying to understand them and plan ahead for them. So. Um, what uh, I'm, I'll, I've been introducing this idea of causal pathway diagrams. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of how you actually develop these causal pathway diagrams. We have those resources developed. If you're interested, um, we've developed a toolkit on what causal pathway diagrams are, how you can develop them, where you get the information you need to, to think about things like mechanisms. How do I know what the mechanism might be for this implementation strategy? Where do I look or how do I think about things like effect modifiers? And you can go to impsimethods.org to access that toolkit. And we have some step-by-step -step instructions as well as some examples to illustrate um, how how to use causal pathway diagrams. Um, what I want to talk to you all about today are some of the core functions of causal pathway diagrams, and then to highlight some of the examples of how these are being used. So <clears throat> we think about causal pathway diagrams as being a tool for helping us to select the right implementation strategy or design implementation strategies to address the determinants and outcomes that we're trying to achieve. CPDs can also be used to optimize multi-component strategies. So we know that many of our um, implementation strategies are packages of strategies that we've put together. And oftentimes what we do is because we want these things to be effective, we um, really bulk up these packages, which become um, very inefficient. And so one way to use causal pathway diagrams is to try to streamline or optimize those implementation strategy packages. They can also be used to understand the conditions under which implementation strategies work by focusing on those preconditions and um, moderators, even if you understand, yes, this strategy can work, it can help you focus in on the conditions under which it is likely to work. They can also help with guiding measurement and evaluation. One of the pieces that I didn't focus on very closely in this talk so far is um, part of what we do is we focus on some of those early signs of success. So many of us have had the experience of you conduct a study, you wait five years to see whether or not your implementation strategy had an effect. Well, when we start to think about not just those distal implementation outcomes that we're trying to achieve, but things like proximal and intermediate outcomes that might be earlier signs of whether or not a strategy is working, that can help us to measure things and measure them earlier and potentially even pivot based on um, whether we're seeing some of those earlier signals of success. Uh, oftentimes folks are using these um, prospectively, but we can also use these retrospectively to try to diagnose what went wrong. Many of us have had the experience of being part of an implementation initiative where we're like, huh, that didn't work like we thought it was going to. And so we've used this as a tool to um, help us to try to diagram what did we think was going to happen and where do we think that broke down so we can alter our approach and do something different next time. And finally, we're using these to develop theory-driven understandings of how our implementation strategies work. So right now in the field, we have um, lots of frameworks that describe what's important. Um, we have some theory, uh, but what we don't have is a good sense of um, strong theory around how our implementation strategies work. So we're also using these to start to develop gener generalizable expl explanations of how implementation strategies work. And I'll touch on that. So I'm going to highlight three different examples that are going to touch on four of these functions of implementation strategies, and I'll be highlighting some of my colleagues' work. So the first is um, my colleague, Mike Pullman, who 
did a really practical um, study using causal pathway diagrams. And so um, his work was focused on addressing barriers to adolescent engagement in digital mental health using some emerging methods. And so Mike has been partnering with a digital mental health um, organization called Oppa Health. Um, they've developed a digital mental health service for youth who are um, age 13 to 18. And uh, what their tool includes, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy based content. So it has worksheets, short form videos by influencers on TikTok. And um, they also use near peer lay mentoring. So they have these trained and supervised young adults. These are recent college graduates who are matched to the youth based on some important characteristics, uh, characteristics things like gender. And what they did is APA had done a pilot study and they found that there was strong engagement in the near with the near peer mentors. So they were meeting with their mentors, but there was less optimal use of the actual video. So they weren't really watching the TikTok videos consistently. And they really saw the TikTok videos as one of the like core components of this intervention because it was actually how they were demoing a lot of the use of the skills. And so they were concerned that the youth weren't really getting the full dose of the, of the treatment. So 80% of them communicated with their mentors, less than 50% viewed the content. So the goal of this work, um, integrating uh, CPDs was first, in their first aim, they wanted to identify research and theory-based barriers to adolescent and young adult engagement with digital mental health resources and corroborate those with the youth. And then um, I partnered with them using causal pathway diagrams to try to enhance the engagement of the youth with the digital mental health content. Um, and we also evaluated the CPD process. So we were using the causal pathway diagrams in this example to select and design strategies to address the youth engagement um, with those videos, uh, and then to also optimize the strategies. So to compare which kind of streamline which strategies we really needed to use so that we wouldn't make the approach too bulky and to really think through under what circumstances would those strategies work. And that really fed back to our decision around which strategies to use. So um, this is their broader process. I won't focus a ton on some of the early steps, but um, they would utilize some of these methods to really understand some of the um, barriers and facilitators to the youth engaging with a digital mental health app. And so they identified some barriers in three different domains. One was related to um, the usability of the app. Um, so they noted things like difficulty finding videos on the platform. They also had some barriers related to the organization and planning. So oftentimes youth would forget to watch um, the videos or they had a busy schedule. And then they also found some barriers related to, to the applicability and the relevance of the content. So sometimes it was the issue, the issue was that the timing of the videos that were being released weren't really tailored to the needs of the youth at that particular time. So um, where we came in using causal pathway diagrams is after we after they identified these um, barriers, we use causal pathway diagrams to try to select some strategies to address these. And so this is an example of how we went through this iterative approach. Um, so what we would do is start, we started with this team. And what I want to highlight is uh, this team was not a team of uh, all researchers. We had um, a software developer on the team who had really done a lot to develop the app and was um, focused on kind of like, how do we distribute this app and, and get a really good workflow down to, to get this out to the youth. Um, there were a couple of clinical psychologists on the team and the CEO of the app. And so all of them were involved in developing the causal pathway diagrams with us. So we first focused on centering the distal outcome that they wanted to achieve, which was they wanted youth to be using the CBT skills. And the earliest signs of success um, to youth using those skills, they really wanted to center on watching those TikTok videos. Now, you know, we might have centered on, there's other things to potentially center on here, but they knew that that engagement was low and that's one of those proximal outcomes that they wanted to achieve. 
And so what we did was we walked them through centering each of the barriers that they had identified in their um, formative work, and then brainstorming various strategies that they thought might be able to address those barriers. And then we would spend some time focusing on the mechanism. So how do you think that strategy would work? And what that did was it allowed us to, in that process of the team talking through, and again, this was a really practical use of CPD. So we weren't looking at theory. We weren't getting super formal and thinking about the mechanism here. This was a, a tool to help them really get clear and precise with their thinking. So they'd have these brainstorming sessions where we'd really just try to click like, uh, articulate sentences about how these strategies would work. And what would happen in the process is sometimes they'd be like, oh, actually, no, that's addressing something else. That strategy wouldn't actually address these multiple steps that the youth are experiencing to accessing videos. So it helped us to throw out some strategies, and then it helped us help to give us a candidate set of strategies that we might be able to use to address this barrier. We repeated this step over and over until we had a bunch of these different stems of the causal pathway diagram that we started to layer on top of each other to select and design the strategies. Um, and so kind of what I just went through, how these would work, and really this helped to um, some, some of the examples of how these things would work. They came up with things like this would simplify the process for them accessing the videos. This would also work by reminding the youth of how, um, how to access these videos. Uh, and then they started to think about, you know, and we started to kind of layer these onto one another. And we were able to see that there were instances where a single strategy could address multiple barriers. And in the process of doing that, we asked these questions of, what would be necessary for this strategy to have a chance at working? And what might increase or decrease the um, how well these strategies work? And so we started to layer on these preconditions and these moderators to make sure that we felt confident that the strategies under these conditions could still work. And eventually, um, so what this did is it helped us to streamline. So we found you know, one strategy that can address multiple barriers. Um, and it, as I mentioned, helped us to understand those conditions under which the strategy would work. So for example, they knew that um, this is actually only gonna work if the youth have decent in internet quality. And so they knew that this was limiting them to um, uh, one group that this was likely excluding was some of the youth they wanted to reach in rural areas. And while they decided that's okay for them right now, they knew that in order for this approach to, to be effective with that population in the future, they were gonna have to address this as well. So eventually we ended up layering this and um, this is kind of the ultimate thing that we ended up with, but the, but the approach is very iterative where we're making one of these at a time and then coming up with our full approach for how we were going to address these barriers. And what I want to call out here, I don't necessarily want you to take this all in, but we ended up um, choosing two strategies that we thought could address all five barriers. And there was some interdependency between these strategies. Part of why this strategy was chosen was to actually address one of those preconditions um, they needed the youth to be able to find that link easily. And so this strategy was used to both address that and make this um, pathway possible to improve outcomes and to address these um, independent barriers that they found as well. So that was a really practical use of causal pathway diagrams. Um, this is, a, I'm going to highlight an example um, that my colleagues Maria Hugh at the University of Kansas and Aaron Line have been working on. Um, and they're using, they're navigating causal pathways to optimize a multifaceted theory informed implementation strategy. So um, they have been, de they've developed and have been studying um, an impl multifaceted implementation strategy called BASIS, Beliefs and Attitudes for Successful Implementation in Schools. And they developed this based on the theory of planned behavior and um, the health action process approach. And so this was already a very theory-driven implementation strategy where they proposed that these motivational components and these volitional components 
would activate these mechanisms, have downstream outcomes on implementation intentions, um, and Im impact these implementation outcomes of adoption, fidelity, and sustainment. And that these volitional components would impact maintenance of self-efficacy, which also would impact this proximal and later distal outcomes. So point here is they have this very well thought out implementation strategy that they've been seeing some positive effects for. And um, what they've been doing is they've been evolving basis. So first they started out with their basis pilot, which was their original recipe. So this was a uh, three hour, two, three hour ses sessions delivered by an expert with a P uh, expert PhD researcher. Um, this was a synchronous live strategy. And then they moved to their R01, where they stepped this down slightly by having a trained um, motivational interviewer mental health clinician with school-based experience deliver this training in a, in a synchronous Zoom setting. And then they stepped it down even further to have it be uh, a bit shorter in their FC trial and delivered mostly with video and facilitation from former educators. So really trying to get more and more practical in the delivery of this and also delivered synchronously with Zoom. And now what they're focusing on is they're really trying to optimize basis. So they want to optimize it. They want it to be effective. That's important. They want to maintain their effectiveness, but they want it to be more efficient. Um, well, it looks kind of efficient. There's all kinds of components that actually make up basis. And they want to understand how can we prioritize those most um, critical components of basis so that we maintain its um, effectiveness, but we also prioritize the economy. Um, and and they're also exploring asynchronous delivery of this, and they want to be able to do it, um, want digitized delivery so that it can be scalable. So um, their question was, how do we make beyond basis? And the way that they've been approaching this is they're identifying processes through which the strategies operate. So these are already tested strategies, but now they're taking a step back and really trying to, in a fine grain way, understand how do each of the components in our implementation strategy package work. And they're also focusing on some of those moderators and, and preconditions because they want to understand which aspects of basis are transportable across context. As they move this across different settings, they want to understand the things that might make it work better or worse, or the things that they might need to adapt to make it work in different settings. So they're asking which components of basis are most logically related to their target mechanisms based on causal pathways and cause, and then using these CPDs, um, they're asking how can we make, uh, how can we package a digitized basis to test in um, they're doing a rapid analog trial um, to understand how each of these components work. So eventually they'll get some evidence at the component level about how different combinations of components of basis work. So there's a lot going on here. I don't actually expect you to take um, most of this in, but I want you to see a little bit of their process. So they brought their team together and what they would do is um, they first broke up the basis components um, based on when they were happening and what each of those components were. So they have this pre-session, they have this post-session, and each of those has a bunch of different components. And what they tried to do was use their mechanisms from that they had articulated in their original theory of change and try to understand which mechanisms are each of these components activating. What are some of the moderators that we think affect um, how well the components work and what are the preconditions that affect this as well? And um, so what I think one of the really interesting things here is uh, when when you see this packaged up in their original theory of change, it's like, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense. This is really simple. And actually there's so much complexity here that helps them to really understand how they could mix and match different components um, based on some of these dependencies. So what this eventually led to was them coming up with um, different combinations of strategies that they put together um, and making sure that those, and really articulating which 
which mechanisms do we think those components are impacting? So they could put put this together in a trial now where they are testing various combinations of these components. So they ended up with 14 different conditions where they're going to be able to collect some evidence on whether or not these um, different components are activating the mechanisms of interest and their downstream implementation outcomes. And the last example I want to just briefly touch on is how we're using causal pathway diagrams to theorize, to, to develop these micro theories of how implementation strategies work. So this is part of a NCI funded R01 that we've been working on, um, where we're focused on um, the mechanisms of various implementation strategies. And so I've been working with this super fun and bright team. Um, and what we've been doing is trying to understand how when and under what conditions do implementation strategies work? So we took 30 implementation strategies from the ERIC compilation, um, and we went through this process of each of us would take a strategy and we'd go through a process of doing a literature review of the existing evidence and theory for that strategy. Then, um, and we would start to develop our causal pathway diagram based on some of that information. Now, of course, not all of that is out there. There's lots of, there's very little information on mechanisms through which strategies work. There's also lots of missing information on potential moderators and preconditions. So then we'd engage in novel theorizing of proposing how we think these strategies work. We'd get together in these three-day deep dives and present our causal pathway diagrams and refine them. And then we um, we developed these surveys and we have been um, gathering expert feedback on our theories and causal pathway diagrams about how these strategies work. And we've been refining those, um, those micro theories based on expert feedback. So we just published our first um, paper describing three of these, um, three of these micro theories that you can access. Uh, and I want to just really briefly touch on this. So the first one is a micro theory of opinion leadership. And so as you can see here, we've tried to first um, articulate what is opinion leadership? What is it comprised of? Um, what is the out, what's the distal outcome that we think opinion leadership actually has a chance of impacting? And then what is this, what is the process through which this can work? And what are some of the things that might make it work better or worse? And some of the preconditions to whether or not it works at all. We've gone through this process for another implementation strategy, innovation championing. And so you can see there's often complexity here in um, there might be multiple mechanisms that we think that um, championing is activating. And depending on how we operationalize championing, it may or may not actually activate each of these mechanisms. Um, and based on some of the, the feedback and refinements we've gotten from our um, experts who have been reviewing these, it's helped us to kind of articulate different pathways that this can take depending on some of um depending on how the strategy op operates and the last one we really that that is included in this paper is really focusing on educational outreach visits and so one of the really useful things in thinking through this was really articulating what what needs to be um how do in, how do these educational outreach visits need to be operationalized so they can work? And what do each of these operationalizations do? Are they affecting a moderator? Are they affecting a proximal outcome or a distal outcome here? So our goal with these micro theories are first to propose testable hypotheses, hypotheses about which outcomes we think our implementation strategies can, um, can impact and which we don't think they can impact um, by proposing the pathway of, by trying to answer the question of how we think these work by proposing mechanisms and also the conditions under which these work. Uh, and our goal is really to guide future research that can validate these and invalidate these theories so that we can refine them. Um, and also just to provide a process and approach for promoting other people to continue to theorize about how their implementation strategies work.
So um, that is the bulk of what I wanted to talk to you about today. The last thing I wanted to highlight, I think the link was already shared. Um, so thank you for sharing that. But I talked a bunch about uh, causal pathway diagrams today. Our team has... Um, We've been funded by two different P50 grants, and we've been developing a few different methods. Um, we've had some of our collaborators develop some uh, uh, a toolkit around how to use rapid evidence synthesis to leverage existing evidence about determinants that are likely to impact implementation. Um, our another colleague has developed a toolkit around rapid ethnographic assessment to really go deep in understanding the determinants that are likely to affect implementation and really deeply understand the context in which we're working before we try to intervene in those contexts. And then um, another colleague has also developed a toolkit to prioritize implementation barriers. So going beyond ratings of impact and feasibility and trying to think about other things that we might want to use to prioritize which determinants we address, like issues of equity, and then thinking about how do we take in these multiple ratings and make decisions about which implement, uh, which uh, determinants we want to address. So I'd encourage you all to check out some of those if it sounds of interest. Um, and thanks so much for listening. I'd love to chat about any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Meza. Um, I think I have a much better understanding of causal pathway diagrams after listening to your presentation. Um, Good, I'm glad it added <laughs> some clarity. Clear. Um, while we wait for some questions in the chat, one thing that I was um, interested in asking you about is just the experience of bringing this methodology, the causal pathway diagrams to some of the community partners. And in yeah. the first example, um, with the uh, TikTok videos um, and, and getting increased kind of access and engagement of, of the youth, I, I really liked how you made it kind of an iterative, very community engaged approach. And I, so I'm just kind of wondering like, how was the experience of bringing this methodology to like your kind of interested parties or, or community yeah. partners and, and um, end users? Yeah. You know, any sort of like challenges that you experienced Absolutely. or, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So I was that this is probably one of our first really practical applications of the tool. And so I was a little nervous going into it, um, especially because we were working with non-researchers about like how this was going to be received and just working with folks in industry who maybe don't have some of the same. I anticipate there might not be the same like patience and this might feel like this intellectual exercise where they might just be more like really solution oriented, like let's go, 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 rather than like what we're asking them to do is slow down with us and think about this. So we actually did this. We did, I think it was four 90 minute sessions of working through this. So we did this slowly. Um, and I was a little nervous about whether or not that would be acceptable to them. And I didn't actually present this data, um, but my colleague, Mike Pullman, had um, collected some data from them about like the experience doing this. And generally, my memory of it is that the ratings were pretty good. I think they found the process useful. They thought that they got to a solution that made sense. I think that... Um, they gave us some feedback about it wasn't the most efficient process and it's not part of the goal here is to slow things down. And I think that's an important thing to think about is, do you have the time? And oftentimes our argument is that like, if you put in the time now, you're not going, it's going to save you time later in designing something that's likely to work, but it can take time. Um, I would say that some of my key lessons that I've come away with in working with that team, but also other community partners is um, one about the language we use. So we're talking to researchers here. So I'm going to talk about things like mechanisms and effect modifiers. When I'm talking to folks, um, to community partners, I'm not going to use that language. I'm going to, you know, and I might not even, I might not even use the diagram. So the diagram is a structure for thinking. Oftentimes when I'm trying to get at some of these elements with community partners, it's kind of like the framework in the back of my head that I'm using to ask the questions. And um, having us articulate mechanisms might be like, hey, okay, so we have this strategy and we have this barrier we're trying to address. Can we come up with like an if then statement of how this is going to work? If we do this strategy, 
then it's going to address this barrier by how, by doing what. And so it can, so I encourage people to get creative and think about who am I talking to and what are the tools that I need to use to get at this idea? It doesn't have to be putting the words in the box, doesn't have to be using the, the term mechanism, but it's um, using the structure to get clear about what are the things we should be thinking about. So I've often learned that like the terminology needs to be adapted to fit who you're working with and asking practical questions. Um, but that the benefits are often come from the slowing down, knowing what questions you want to ask, like, how is this going to work? What would be the earliest signs of success or failure to know whether or not this is working? What's going to make this work better or worse? But really thinking about those practical questions um, and getting people, I love to use very interactive tools. So I'm usually using like Miro to do these things, to get people in there, typing it in themselves. And so, um, to get people engaged because I, it's not just researchers who theorize and who have, um, who can think, think with precision. We all have theories about how things work in the world, right? Even as kids, we're asking questions of like, how does that work? How does that work? And we have these implicit theories about how our interventions work. And so it's just trying to give people a structure to get explicit about that. No, oh, that's, that's great. No, I love the kind of the, um, the translation of this research tool to like, uh, more like basic day-to-day -day kind of practical use and an everyday type of language so that it's actually probably more usable to yeah forward. The, the last other thing I'll just throw in there, I know there's another question, is um, that we, we didn't talk a lot about this, but we do in the toolkit, um, is think about what question you're trying to answer. So a causal pathway diagram, there are various questions within there that are being answered. One is like, what do I think this can, what kind of outcomes do I think this can achieve? Um, how do I think this works? Under what conditions do I think this works? Which of those conditions are absolutely necessary to be in place? You might not need answers to all of those questions. You might already have some of these the answers to those questions. So oftentimes I'll see people feel like they have to complete the whole diagram because like that's how you do it right. And think about what are the questions that this tool might be answering and what aspects of the tool might you need to use to answer that question. And it might not be all of those questions that you need answered. So also just encouraging like flexible use of tools like this to really think about what is it that you need to know and what do you want to spend your time talking about to answer that question? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat now, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, the first question is, how do you differentiate between mechanisms and determinants and outcomes? I understand the technical definition, but sometimes they feel repetitive. For example, a determinant could be lack of knowledge, a mechanism is increasing knowledge, an outcome is increased knowledge, which feels a bit redundant. Absolutely. Um, so a few things. Um... I, let me just like go back to a picture of a, sorry, no, I'm scrolling through this. So I think that's a great question. This is something we've grappled with so much in our process of trying to develop these causal theories of how implementation strategies work. And um, what I would say is that, um, first of all, we are still grappling with this a ton and it depends. So um, the first thing I'd say is that like, all of these things here, everything in the STEM here is asking the question, how does this work? So I think part of this is like, does the label mechanism matter a ton to you? What are you trying to understand? Are you trying to convince yourself that you're likely to, in, to impact your downstream outcome? And if so, all of all of these steps matter in explaining how. Now, when we get into more like, statistical and research, you know, um, uh, domains, we do differentiate between mediators and mechanisms, whereas like mediators are things along the chain of events. And so I often think about the determinants and the proximal outcomes. These are mediators, but the mecha mechanism is really the thing that explains that process of change. Sometimes that's clear. Sometimes that distinction works. Sometimes it doesn't. And so there have been times where 
Um, the, what I have found, um, is that sometimes this chain of events is long enough that differentiating between the implementation strategy and the determinant by explaining the mechanism is super useful because there's like this chain, clear chain of events that are happening that we can come up with this rich explanation that convinces us um, that this strategy is a good fit. There are other times where the chain of events just seems so close together that are, when we're articulating a mechanism, it's we end up just saying it's the absence of the barrier, which is completely useless. Like there's no that that's just circular reasoning of this strategy works by addressing the barrier. That's not a mechanism. And so what I've started to ask myself is, why do I need to know the mechanism and is it useful? And I don't think articulating mechanisms is always useful. Does it actually answer a question? Do you have some doubt about this causal process? And there are times at which when we were trying to articulate the how a strategy addressed a determinant, it was just obvious. It was just like so the the it was just very plain and there weren't really these like causal processes that we could articulate that added any additional knowledge. So that's not a perfect answer, but I hope that it kind of like helps to acknowledge the nuance that is there. And it is okay to ask, is there like, is there information that this is adding here? And I think that sometimes like the question of like, what's a determinant and what's an outcome depends on your lens. You know, are you trying to get all the way, how far down are you trying to get? Are you trying to get all the way to implementation outcomes and trying to get all the way down to like, potentially I might even include client outcomes here. So how long is that chain of events that you're trying to address? And, um, and I would encourage you to like, don't feel like you need to engage in this circular reasoning around the me uh, the determinant. Um, this works by just removing the determinant. If that's where you're stuck and you really can't get clearer than that, maybe there's not a lot of utility there. Um, but it's something we grapple with a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you for that great explanation. Um, and then there's just another, one more question I think we can maybe try to squeeze in. Um, do you think using the type of uh, language of CPDs that's um, more uh, kind of targeted for like a lay population or lay language um, could help sort of increase access to, um, you know, uh, implementation science uh, methods and frameworks if we used yeah. it in research papers? Yeah, you know, this is something we've been grappling with. Like we've been trying to develop tools in parallel where we have kind of these like research facing tools and these more practice oriented tools. And I think part of the dilemma, I think, yes, like the more accessible the language we use, um, the better it is for everybody. And um, having a shared nomenclature at, is, is useful and things like mechanisms, mediators, moderators, do have precise meanings. And so we're trying to both get at the precision um, that so folks who are actually using this to inform their study designs and might be actually statistically testing some of these ideas and folks who use similar tools like causal loop diagrams, um, mechanisms map, mechanism mapping, we're kind of speaking, we know which of the elements correspond to one another. And at the same time, that limits some of the practicality of it. So we've taken the approach of kind of thinking about who's our audience and how do we how do we like share it, describe these concepts so that we are kind of sticking to some of the existing shared nomenclature in the science. And it's a trade-off um, in practicality. So just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing a lot of us grapple with is just how how we do a better job translating a lot of this. <laughs> absolutely to, to a more accessible um kind of strategy platform um yes. style you know for for our partners yes and we're trying to work on that and i'd also encourage folks like translate don't feel stuck to this language you know best like the folks you're working with and what's going to resonate and not resonate with them and if like the face validity is not there and you're just like this is going to be confusing change the words like feel confident doing that yeah yeah i i totally agree
Okay, well, this was a fantastic presentation, Dr. Meza. Thank you again so much. Um, and I just want to thank everyone on the Zoom for attending today and remind everyone that next Tuesday, October 22nd at 12 p.m., we all have Dr. Elizabeth McGuire presenting on study teams and implementation science, recommendations from a systematic review of teamwork and implementation outcomes. So we hope you can all join us again next week.